Jesus says, I desire blessing and not sacrifice. Lord, we come to you in, in humility, in awe and wonder at your beauty, your majesty, your, your glory, all these attributes that we struggle to understand. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. Lord, you are so righteous. that we should remain in judgment. And yet, Lord, we praise you for your Son, that you would love us in such a way to send your Son to die for us. Lord, we pray for this church. We thank you for it. Lord, we pray for the unity of the church. Lord, we continue weekly to pray for unity, Lord, because you prayed for the unity of the church. You prayed that we would be one as you are one with the Father. Lord, I pray that that would be a lived reality for us, a lived experience. Would we know the feeling of, of being one with one another? We pray for the leadership of this church. We pray for our elders. Lord, we thank you for, for establishing leaders. We thank you for that, the design of your, the beauty of your design to give us multiple leaders to, to study your word, to devote themselves to prayer to teach, to shepherd, to protect. We pray for we pray for our elders. Lord, give us wisdom. Lord, we need your wisdom and we pray and we ask for your wisdom. We pray for governments. We thank you for our government, Lord. We ask that you would bless the German government for the freedom they've continued to allow us. Lord, I ask that you would give them great effect in their, their policy decisions. Would they be good and righteous? Would you give them wisdom, Lord? Would your, um, your justice reign? Lord, we pray for the, the spread of the gospel and the, the salvation of souls. Lord, we, we, your church, have been given a mission to, to make disciples, to make followers of Christ. Lord, we pray that that would be, that would be done, not just here in this, in our midst, but Lord, Across the city, across the globe, we also lift up global missionaries, Lord, foreign workers who are struggling in, these situa in this current climate, this current situation. They're struggling to share the gospel. They're struggling with fatigue. They're struggling with governments who are not letting them in or sending them away. We trust that you are sovereign Lord, we trust that you are building your church. We pray that there would be a great harvest. We pray for more workers. Lord, we pray that we would be built up in love. Lord, we read from Ephesians 2, and if we had turned the page and read from Ephesians 4, we would see your design for each part of the church, building one another up in love. 
We pray that that would be done. Lord, we pray for this week I lift up our sister church, IBC Church in Brasilia. And I pray for their pastor, Dave. And I thank you, Lord, for the, the call of their new associate pastor, Marcelo. I ask that you'd be with Marcelo and his family as he makes a career change from banking to full-time ministry. As his family adapts to that, Lord, I ask that you would be gracious to them. I thank you for the, the growth in that church. I thank you for Pastor Dave's heart to, to train and develop Marcelo as a leader. I thank you for bearing fruit in that church, and I pray that having a Brazilian associate pastor in that church would be the start of wonderful things in Brasilia. Lord, I want to pray for this church's ministry partner, Aquila Initiative, who yesterday uh, initiated three apprentices. Lord, coming from two churches that are within our network, our mother church, IBC Cologne, I pray that you would be with that church, bless that church. Would it grow in unity? Would it grow in love? Would it be built up in faith? Lord, I pray that they would nurture their ministry apprentices. Would they grow in, in knowledge and understanding? I pray also, Lord, for ICF, International Christian Fellowship in, in Frankfurt, a sister IBC church, and pray that you would bless them as they continue to equip ministry leaders, as they continue to plant churches. Lord, we pray we as a, a, a church plant know the, the blessings that come from, from other congregations, from other groups of, of believers. We know the blessing of being planted. Lord, would that blessing, would that joy never wear off, but Lord, would we be eager, would we be earnest to do the work of the mission of the church, of making disciples? Lord, would you lead this church as, as we have for months? Lord, give us wisdom. We. We want to be a church that plants other churches. Lord, that is our desire. We ask for wisdom, direction, guidance. Lord, finally, I ask that you would prepare all our hearts for the hearing of the word of God preached. Be with Eddie. Lord, you know I love Eddie. But Eddie, like me, is a sinner. Eddie, like any of us, is we are but creatures. We ask that you would strengthen him. Lord, give him confidence, give him boldness as he proclaims the word that you have given him to preach. Would your word go forth? Would it be received by ears that are humble, would we be eager to hear you speak to us and feed us. In your son's name we pray, amen. Yeah, hello church. Good morning. Yeah, it's really happy to be able to bring the word again today. I thank uh, Pastor Stephen for giving me this opportunity. 
So today uh, we'll continue with our series on Matthew. This time we'll start with uh, Matthew chapter 12. And we'll look at the first 14 verses. Matthew 12, 1 through 14. Okay. Please let's stand up for the reading of his word. At that time, Jesus went through the green fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence? which it was not lawful for them to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath." He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man who was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him? He said to them, which one of you who has a ship, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it up? Of how much more value is a man than a ship? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you, Father, for this uh, powerful text, Lord, for this very rich text, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you give me the words, Lord, as I proclaim now in front of this church and in front of those watching us from home, following us online. Father, may I say the truth. May I speak the truth. Father, if I say what is not right, I pray, Lord, that they will forget it so that you should not have any negative influence or impact in their lives. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for our service. This is in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, okay, last time, oh, in the last time, oh, in uh, Matthew, we saw that uh, the disciples were obeying Jesus, but of course, Jesus was facing opposition. So looking at the first verse, you know, the first verse he talks of, he said, at that time, you know, that's the first thing. When you look at verse 1, just the first words, at that time, what time is he talking of? Just like in verse, in chapter 11, that is the time when Jesus was moving through the villages in Galilee, teaching, performing miracles, casting out demons, and of course, facing opposition you know, from the scribes and the Pharisees. So that is the season they're talking of here. So at that time, what happened then in from verse 1? So Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. So to go through the grain fields on the Sabbath is, I would say, okay, isn't it? But it continues, you see. So his disciples were hungry, still in verse 1, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. Still very okay, isn't it, to go into a grain field and pluck grains or heads of grain to eat. Normally, that's what one would expect, isn't it? And still, it is lawful. It is not wrong. You see, the law did not prohibit that. It was very okay to go into the grain fields and pluck heads of grain to eat. The problem came if you now decided now to start using like a stick, say a knife, and to be putting it in bags or to go and sell it. You know, when you are storing and gathering it, that is the problem. So, to show that it is right, uh, there is even this verse here. If you look at uh, Deuteronomy 23, 24, 
to 25, you'll see. He say, if you go into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, as many as you wish, but you shall not put any in your bag. If you go into your neighbor's standing green, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not pluck, put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain, so sickle, some, something like a knife, you see. So it was very lawful for them to uh, go on this way and pluck these grains, you see. The thing is that the law, you know, we have a loving God, you know, who takes care of the poor. And God made provision for it already, even in the law. You know, if you look at Leviticus 23, uh, uh, 22, I don't think you have it here on the screen. I'll read it, say, and when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord their God. You see? So it was very normal that when harvesting, you were not to harvest everything for the poor. And of course, we know that Jesus' disciples were poor. So it was very okay for them to go there. And they were just plucking these heads of grain to eat. They were not gathering it, so it was very normal and very okay for them to do it. But still, just the fact that it was on the Sabbath, we now have now these Sabbath controversies. So we are now going to look at the Sabbath controversies. So it now starts now in verse 2. It says, when, But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. You see? So the problem is not that they were plucking these heads of grain. The problem is that they were doing it on the Sabbath. And according to the scribes and the Pharisees, that was wrong. Okay, before we now look at Jesus' defense, let's just try to look at the term Sabbath. So the Sabbath day in itself, what is it? So the term Sabbath is derived from a Hebrew word, you know, which means uh, to rest or to cease or to stop an activity. So it has a lot to do with Sabbath means to rest, you know, to cease. And the Sabbath day uh, was uh, from God, you know, in honor of his creation. You know, God rested after his creation. If you look at Genesis 2, Chapter 2 says, So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work he had done. You see? So God rested from his work. So God resting, please let's not get it wrong. I say God was so exhausted that he needed to rest. That's not the point. You know, he had finished what he had planned to do. So, of course, when you finish, what do you do? You stop, and then you rest. And, of course, and then what does he do? Then you enjoy then the beauty of your creativity. Of course, this rest is a pattern we follow today, isn't it? You walk, and you rest. And that's very good, even for us, even for our health. You know? So what backs up this? Because I've, uh, when you look at some commentaries or some people say he was really tired. That's not the case. You know, if you look at Isaiah 40, 28, it says, Have you not known... Have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So that's very clear. So the Lord declared then the seventh day of the week to be a special day of rest. So I've been in a Bible studies or groups where people always argue. When they talk of the Sabbath, is it not a Sunday? You know, I have the impression at times Christians want this day to be the to be a Sunday so that it will be as if we are following this rule. But that's not necessary. Technically speaking, the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, and that is a Saturday. It is not a Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week, and it is very okay for us to meet on, the, on a Sunday. You know, just like uh, the apostles, you know, after the resurrection, the apostles were gathering on Sundays, isn't it? Then it became a routine and a tradition. So it is very normal for us to meet on Sunday. But there is still nothing for those who meet on, 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 on Saturday or any other day. We, should, we are should worship, to worship every day. But we have this one special day of rest for corporate worship like we heard at the beginning. It's very important. 
this uh, special day of rest was even incorporated into the Ten Commandments. So if you look at Exodus 20 from verses 8 to 11, you see that it is incorporated there in the Ten Commandments. And the Sabbath was a very important day. You know, the commands were very clear. You see, we, you could not play with the Sabbath. If you look at Exodus 31, verse 12, you will see this very, very clear warning and consequence. Now, the Sabbath is a sign or was a sign between the people of Israel and God, you see. So that was it. If you read, uh, let's read Exodus 31, 14 to 15. It says, you shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. Of course, when you hear or you read such uh, commands from God, it's very normal that uh, you are supposed to be very careful with that day. But the problem is that the scribes and the rabbis, then after a very long period now, decided now to ask the question, what is work? God says, don't do any ordinary work. So the question now was, what is not the definition of work? So they came up now with their own definition of work, and that is the problem. So they actually misinterpreted work, and that now became a burden to people. I'll just give you an example of the things without going in details. So, for example, one example is that you could not travel more than 3,000 feet. That's less than a kilometer, 950 meters, for example, from your home. You see, you could not carry a burden that weighed more than a dried fig. Uh, then uh, there were some 39 uh, actions that were outlined in their Jewish oral law. Not the Jewish law, not the first five books of the Bible or so, but talking of they had Jewish traditional laws that they themselves, they wrote. So it had like this Mishnah, it had 39 outline actions, you know, that were forbidden to do on the Sabbath. For example, you could not light fire, or uh, you were not uh, supposed to walk like clean water. So if you are bathing and then water touches the floor, that is work to clean it up. Then... Uh, Looking now at our text, going back to our text. So what is now, technically speaking, the complaint? Why are they complaining in this text? In this text, they are now plucking grains, isn't it? They're plucking heads of grains. Yes. So what is now, technically speaking, the problem? The thing is that in, out of one of these 39 uh, uh, actions that were forbidden, you had now some things there that had to do now with plucking grain. For example, one of them was reaping. So in this particular case, they are being accused of reaping. So to reap is like to pluck the grain. Another one is threshing, you know, when you rub the grains in your hands. Then the next one is winnow, you know, when you rub it, then you blow. Now to separate the chaff, that's another thing. And all of that, they will say if you do all those three, the next is that you eat it and you are preparing food. So those are all things that were forbidden on that day. So that is why the Pharisees were complaining. So it's not about them plucking grain. It's on that day and because of these uh, restrictions, these actions that were written in the Jewish traditional or the Jewish oral laws. So we now come now to Jesus now, to Jesus' defense. So Jesus now defends his disciples. And to just summarize the main things he's saying, Jesus in his defense, is showing that the Sabbath was never intended to exclude or restrict deeds of, in, deeds of necessity. That it was never meant to exclude or restrict service to God. And that it was never meant to restrict acts of mercy, compassion, and love. So those are the three, actually, subheadings, I'll say. So we'll look at the first one, you know, first of all, the deeds of necessity. So if you look at now, uh, 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 he says, the Sabbath, you know, the Sabbath was to bring rest and not meant to exclude all these things. So the Sabbath was meant to bring rest and not meant to exclude deeds of necessity, service to God, and acts of mercy. So let's now 
go back to our text. So having had an idea of the Sabbath and how important it was and the interpretation that led now to this uh, uh, controversy, we'll now go back to our text. So if you look at uh, verses 3 and 4, you know, he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of their presence, which it was not lawful for them to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. So these incidents, uh, I'm sure some of you know this incident, is one incident that, that is described in 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 6. So if you go to 1 Samuel 21, 1 to 6, you will see it. We don't need to read it here, but I'll just summarize it, you see. It, is, it was at one point when David was running away from King Saul. We know King Saul was the first king of Egypt, and King David was the second one. At that point in time, even, David had already been anointed king. But Saul wanted to kill him, so David was running away and with his people, his army. So he became hungry, and then when he became hungry, that was then he went to Nob. Nob is around Jerusalem. He went then to Ahimelech, the priest, in the tabernacle, because at that time the temple was not yet built. So when David went there, he was hungry and asked for food. He asked for five loaves of bread. Then the priest, Ahimelech, told him, well, I'm sorry, we don't have ordinary bread. So I cannot help you, kind of. But the priest said, but there is only the holy bread, the bread of presence. That's what they call bread of presence. Which, of course, is normally only to be eaten by the priests. But Ahimelech gave David and his men the bread. So this is normally bread that is not supposed to be eaten by it. Ordinary people is only to be given by priests from the Levites family, but he gave it to David and the others who were not supposed to eat it. So normally, technically speaking, that was unlawful. But Jesus is now saying, this is now a law that was broken. But what happened to David? Nothing happened to David because God is more interested in how people feel, the well-being of people. So did, should, uh, God did not want to allow David and his men to starve. So although, technically speaking, it was not right, God did not do anything to them. You see, So if you want to know more about the bread of presence, you can read uh, Leviticus uh, 24, uh, verses 5 to 9. Just uh, briefly, it consisted of 12 loaves of bread, representing the 12 tribes, and it was placed... Uh, every week in the, in the temple or, or tabernacle. So every week they replaced it with fresh bread. And then the bread that was being replaced now could now be eaten by Aaron and his sons, meaning the Levites, the priests. So we are seeing that on this occasion, in their hunger, David and his young man ate these second loaves and no blame was attached to them, you see, because human need is more important you know, than some ritual customs. And God has a heart for us. Okay. So that is the first uh, uh, response uh, uh, Jesus gave uh, to these accusations. So then the other response he gave is now in verse 5. He say, Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? We know that on the Sabbath, uh, there are rituals that take place, isn't it? You know, what happens is, you know, the kindlings of fire, uh, the animals are slaughtered and prepared, and all of these things that take place are normally things that are forbidden, you know, according to the Jewish tradition. But on the Sabbath, these priests do it. Because if the priests don't do it, how are they then going to celebrate you see, it's just like asking a pastor not to preach on a Sunday. So the priests do these things that are also forbidden. But nothing happens to them because they are serving the people. So that's what we talk of service to God. So th there is nothing wrong in serving people, in serving God on the Sabbath. Then, if you look at uh, uh, verse 6, no. 
this, Jesus says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. You know, if we know how uh, important the Jews attached uh, or how much importance the Jews attached to the temple, then this statement is one that people could actually even stone Jesus, the Jews at that time. If you had fanatic words, I'm sure they would have even started. You know, he's saying he's greater than the temple. Then he also referred them to what David did. You know, David was also a hero. That's the first thing. David is a hero. They're saying David did what was lawful. Then he's now saying he's greater than the temple. You know, these are normally things that the Jews of that time did not want to hear. But this is what Jesus is saying. And he's indeed greater than the temple. Jesus says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Hmm? If you look at verse 7, say, and in verse 7, say, and if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. You see. So the whole point is just the sacrificial system and the interpretation of these laws. So Jesus and God did not want all these laws and following him to become a burden. But you know, if you have to rest on a certain day, isn't it? To rest from work, to relax, to set this day really holy. Relax is not like sleeping the whole day. It's more of really resting, first of all, also physically to uh, regain energy, to be refreshed. But at the same time, and that is the more important thing, to actually thank God for creation and to worship him on that day. So that we're talking of one day. It was Saturday, technically speaking, about, but for us, now we're talking of a Sunday, so it is there. So how can I rest if before doing anything, I have to go and check my text if it's right to do something? So that's the thing. So we remember in chapter 11, we remember the invitation, isn't it? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So it is a burden if you have to think of what to do on that day. Should I bathe? Should I cook? Should I eat something? So that is what they are talking of. That is a big burden. And that was not the intention. Jesus knows the intention of it. And that's why Jesus is telling them that he is greater than the temple. He is telling them that mercy is better than all the sacrifices. He is telling them that compassion is important. He is telling them that love is important. You know, We, we saw this text already when we were looking at... Uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 30, you see. I'll just read just um, a few verses. If you look at Matthew 23, 2 to 4, here's what Jesus tells his disciples about the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move with their finger. Another one, Matthew 23, 13 to 15 says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land, to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Proselyte, that's a non a Gentile now being converted now to Judaism, following now the Jewish rituals, including circumcision, for example. So the main point is just that Jesus is telling them that they missed the point. It is not really our place to criticize scribes and Pharisees. That's not the point. We are just trying to interpret the text the way it is. So we try to learn what we can do better. Because although we are not the Pharisees, nowadays some of us still do things that are the same, isn't it? On a Sunday, you go to church. That is the day of worship. After the two-hour service, you put on now another face. From Monday to Saturday, you put on another face. Then on Sunday, you put on this face. So that is being mechanical. That's not what God wants. What God wants our hearts. Coming down now uh, to uh, verse 8, this Jesus makes now another very, very powerful statement. You know, this is, of course, claim of his deity. 
For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. You know, this is one of the claims just like he's greater than the temple, you know, where they could even stone him. And in this chapter, and from these verses we've read, you know, Jesus uh, saying he's greater than the temple, uh, Jesus saying he's Lord of this, the Sabbath, and all these things in their eyes, Jesus is blaspheming, making himself equal to God. And this is one of the things, and this is around the peak of the time when they will start plotting out to kill Jesus, like we read in uh, verse 14. It is just too much for them to bear. But that's the point. Jesus is saying he is Lord of the Sabbath. And the thing is, if I'm the king or I'm the master of the Sabbath, it means that it's from me. I know what it's all about. I know the intentions behind it. So just do it the way you're supposed to do it. So that is why Jesus is telling them, you have missed the point. It's not about these laws and burden. It is something for you to enjoy. It is the day for you to rest and enjoy. The next section now from verses 9 to uh, 14. And then Jesus then continued, you know. Jesus did not end there, having given this defense, he continued now, you know. He went on from there and entered uh, their synagogue. Well, for those who want uh, references, uh, the uh, passage on I desire uh, mercy and not sacrifice is a quotation from Hosea 6.6. 6. If you want to refer it, you can refer it from there. Mm. So in verse, Jesus went now into the synagogue in verse 9, you see, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? You know, the question is so that they might accuse him, you know. I mean, Jesus has been saying it, isn't it, the whole time, is it? It is lawful to heal. And in general, to do good on the Sabbath. So there is nothing wrong in healing or in doing good on the Sabbath. So it is lawful to heal and to do good on the Sabbath. So then Jesus asked them a question in verse 11. says, which one of you who has a ship, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? You know, that's the way Jesus answers his questions, isn't it? You know? <laughs> uh, the questions are such that there is no, the, you, either you are speechless or you just leave, you know? So it says in verse 12, of how much more value is man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then what did Jesus do after uh, responding that way? He asked the man to stretch out his hand. You know, just imagine a person, you know, with this hand, you know, it's kind of inactive. Then they ask you to stretch it up. The question will be normally, how can that be? You know, but when Jesus commands you or sends you somewhere, he equips you, isn't it? So when Jesus says, stretch out your hand, just stretch out the hand. That is obedience. That is faith. So, and the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other. So when the Pharisees went out and then they conspired now to destroy him, for them that was just too much what they experienced on that day, you know. So all the accusations and everything Jesus said, that was just enough for them now to conspire to kill him. Of course, they had already been trying to harm him, but this one now is one of the peaks, you know, that really made them now uh, wanting to try to kill him. So as I round up, I'd just like to look at just a few thoughts. You know, when I talk of worship, you know, I'll bring up some of these thoughts that some Christians have on controversies. Should we worship on a Saturday or a Sunday? Well, we saw it very clearly. The seventh day, the Sabbath, is a Saturday. That is very clear. So we don't need to argue about that one because people try to twist it. No, 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 it's a Sunday. No, the Sunday is the first day of the week. That's the Sabbath. But it is very okay for us to worship on a Sunday. And right, we're here worshiping on the Sunday. I quoted the example already, isn't it? If you look at Acts chapter 20, verse 7, you know, the believers gathered on the first day of the week, isn't it, to break bread. That is a Sunday. If you look at Colossians 2.16, it says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Another verse, Romans 14.5, One person esteems one day as better than the other, while another esteems all these alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So it is very okay for us to worship on a Sunday. And we do that 
especially as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on a Sunday. Remember, even in, the, in Acts chapter 15, during the Jerusalem Council, you know, when uh, they went then uh, to Jerusalem, to uh, Peter, the leader of the church, and the others asking about uh, Gentiles, uh, if they can go directly uh, to Christ, or they have to follow up the, follow the Mosaic laws. But they said, no, they did not. They gave them a few things to follow, but not like the Sabbath and the other things, meaning that the Sabbath is to be considered as a ceremonial law, almost like circumcision, but not uh, for us to, to follow. It is a covenant between God and the people of Israel. Okay. We've talked a lot about the Pharisees. Let's talk about ourselves as we conclude. So, if our worshiping God is only a Sunday act, then we have missed the point. God wants our heart. God wants our heart. Actions resulting from truly following God, from truly following Jesus, is what is required. So we are not saying when you are saved, you should not work for your salvation. That's not the point. You know, just come to him and follow what he's telling you to do. Obey his commands. We have a lot of traditions. And some of these traditions have to do also with our background, where we come from, isn't it? Let us question tradition. Let us question tradition. Is what I am doing right because I learned it from my parents? Is that in line with the teachings of the Bible? If that's not in line, it's to pray about it and to question it. If the way I live in my family is because my parents used to live that way, we should ask ourselves, is it in line with God's teachings? If it is not, we should pray that God should help us so that we should change it. If I'm living as a married couple, am I, are we living the way we're supposed to live? Is that what God is teaching us? If we are dating, if we are not yet married, are we living the way God is saying we should live? If the answer is no, Please come to God in repentance. He is always ready to forgive our sins. God wants our hearts. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for this uh, words, Lord. We pray, Father, that you encourage us, Lord, to follow you truly from the heart. Father, thank you, Lord, for your rest. We know that we have final rest in Jesus, as seen in Hebrews chapter 4. We know that Jesus is our rest. Jesus is our Sabbath. Father, I pray, Lord, for people who struggle a lot, who are having some heavy burdens in many different areas of life. I pray, Lord, that they should come to you. Father, you are always there with your open hands to welcome everybody, to give everyone rest, to give everyone peace. Father, I pray that we should honestly open our hearts to you, that you should search our hearts, Father, and those areas, Lord, that are following by tradition or rules based on our knowledge or the way we grew up or what friends are doing. We pray, Lord, that you search these areas, Lord. You convict us, Father, and that you help us, Father, so that we should walk according to your teachings and not according to what others are doing or what, or according to how we feel, but that we should do it according to your teachings. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for you are so merciful. We pray for merciful hearts. And the only way to do it is to come to you without straining, without struggling. Thank you, Lord. All this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Stephen Campbell and I'm the pastor of IBC Bonn. We are an international community of believers here in Bonn, Germany. We are committed to growing in our love for God, 
for one another and for our neighbor. I hope you've been blessed by the service and invite you to join us each Sunday for a live service at 1030 Central European time for our corporate worship.